worked with uh, uh, an Israeli uh, uh, mission, right? Could you speak more about that? This was another opportunity to try to get a low-cost mission. Now, the Israelis had this, uh, had this instrument ready, Tauvex. It was going to fly on a Russian spacecraft, but then when the Soviets collapsed, that uh, Russian spacecraft also, uh, that went away. And so we said, look, we have an instrument. Why don't we fly it as a secondary payload on an Indian satellite? And so it was accepted for launch on GSAT-4, but then, you know, combination of things, uh, it uh, just never flew, and GSAT-4 blew up anyway, so, so uh, we, we never actually got out into space. But that is the kind of thing that we, that we do want to do. We do want to fly this. We have a German collaboration now mm -hmm. where they will provide a detector, we will provide the, uh, the rest of the instrument, and we're proposing, it, proposing to fly it on a, on a Nistro mission. So, so these are opportunities. We look for them, but uh, ad, as, ad astra, ad aspera, hard to get into space. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. Um, so uh, uh, Sudesh here asks, uh, can you please elaborate on the applications of studying interstellar dust? Okay, I don't know what applicate what you mean by applications, because many times when people say applications, they they're asking. How will it help us uh, build a better car or build a better telephone? So it has no applications per se. What we're doing is truly blue sky research. We're just, we want to learn more about the interstellar dust. Why do we want to learn about the interstellar dust? Well, because it's there. It's there, we want to learn about our universe. And so we have to learn more about it. I see. <laughs> and this is the way that science works really. I and mean, people say, uh, if you talk to politicians, they want you to study only directed things. How do you, uh, how do you have a cure for COVID-19? But that's not the way science works. Science, you, science advances in all areas. You have a broad base. And once you have that broad scientific base, then you get people who, who solve specific applications. And in many ways, if you talk to a pure academic like me, my role, my contribution to society is not actually in, in making life better for people. It's in providing the environment so that people will learn, people will learn how to think, and then those people will then go out and make life better. So there's no accident, you know, Facebook came out of Harvard, Microsoft came out of Harvard, uh, uh, Google came out of Stanford. The, these places come from academic regions. Uh, from academic uh, communities. And the reason they come from academic communities is because of the overall environment. And that perhaps is what you're trying to do with STEMnet also. Yeah, that, that is a good point. And, and uh, thanks for highlighting that because often, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, like you said, people think about immediate applications and what use is it going to be, but knowledge and, and having that scientific attitude is, is an important, uh, action or an act to do as well, uh, which helps in ways you can't measure immediately, right? Um, right. Yeah. So related to, uh, you know, uh, 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 the question before, uh, uh, Raveen comments uh, saying, is interstellar dust dark matter? This is completely different. Dust is, is it's dark in a sense. I mean, the, the terminology gets to be confusing. And so this is where we have to understand that uh, uh, the language of physics is not English or, or Hindi or anything or Canada or anything else. The language of physics is mathematics. So what we mean by dark matter is matter that doesn't interact with regular matter in any way, except by gravity. And the way why it's called dark matter, it actually dates back to the 1930s because people looked at, uh, at, at these clusters of galaxies, Fritz Zwicky, he looked at a cluster of galaxies like the Virgo cluster. And what he noted was that the uh, galaxies that are on the outside are moving so fast that they sh would not be, they would not be uh, held in by the gravity from the objects that you do see. So you have what's called a mass to light ratio. 
and that mass to light ratio was very high. There was a lot more mass than you could see. You knew that mass was there because the galaxies were going around. It's, it's the same way uh, uh, planets go around the sun. The reason the planets go around the sun is because the sun has a huge amount of mass, but we see that mass. <coughs> Here we don't see that mass, and that's why it's called dark matter. And so dark energy is, uh, is something completely different. And dark energy is again, <clears throat> the reason that dark energy is called dark energy is because it's something that we don't understand. And probably in uh, analogy to dark matter, they called it dark energy. And what dark energy is, is that when you look out at, uh, at objects near the edge of the universe, you see that they're accelerating. And this won't happen if you have gravity alone, because gravity is always attractive. So everything, even out to the edge of the universe, it should be slowing. It, now we find that they're going faster. And so what this dark energy is, is a force that acts counter to gravity. It makes things expand. But what it is, we don't know. And so that's why it's called dark energy. So dark matter is matter that only interacts with the rest of the universe through gravity, and we have no idea what it is. They've been looking for the particle, they looked for it for the uh, a Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, but they didn't see it. And so that's why it's called dark matter. I see, very interesting. That was a very uh, lucid explanation of uh, dark matter, which uh, somehow I, I never gathered. It's always this mystery thing that, you know, uh, that uh, goes around and everybody's fascinated by it, but uh, we don't really understand what it is not, right? Um, Shashank asks, what exactly is singularity in space? Is it the end of a black hole? What is white hole and how was it formed? Part of the problem, again, with this is that uh, uh, it's easy to propose problems in English that are then hard to understand. So what we mean by a singularity is a place where the laws of physics, as we know it, break down. That means that, that there is physics there. There is some way that we can understand it, but we don't know what it is. And so that's all that a singularity is. It's some place where we, we don't have an adequate theory to explain why it's there. So that's the singularity. Now, the white hole, this is something that people, that, that, that you play around with the mathematics too much and you get you make some predictions now we've never seen anything like this i i think that a white hole is supposed to be a place you're supposed to go through a black hole and then come out through a white hole so it's a way for interstellar travel but you know this is just it, it, at this point it's just basically as i'm doing it it's just hand waving it, it's not uh, real physics so okay. uh, so that that's all a singularity is just a place where we don't understand what's happening so at the core of the black hole uh, it's uh, the, there's an immense amount of energy there immense amount of gravitational uh, strength we just don't know what's happening i see uh, space is uh, that way endlessly interesting um, so uh, moving on to the next question uh, from bhavin is there any scope for something like citizen science in astrophysics? Any base level data collections sifting through masses of data where lay persons can contribute? It's an enormous amount. And, and again, it's not just in astronomy, but also now that uh, many fields have become data driven, there's an enormous scope for citizen science in, in many areas. You may have known about this protein folding project where. Uh, people try to, uh, to see what the configuration of a protein is. It turns out that it's hard for computers to do, but relatively easy for people to do. And uh, in astronomy, there have been several opportunities. The oldest of this was this uh, SETI at home, which just recently closed down. Uh, there have been other ones that are uh, uh, th things like uh, this Kepler, uh, what's it called? Uh, planethunters.org. There's uh, Galaxy Zoo. 
So these are ways in which you can you can go there. And what they want you to do is to uh, uh, look for planet hunters, for instance. They want you to search for planets in Kepler data. Because the automated algorithms, they will find planets that you know exist. But if you're looking for unusual planets, then that's uh, uh, that that you need people to look at. Uh, so there are there are those kinds of ways of doing it. There are also, as I as I said earlier, all astronomy data is now available. Not all, but ninety percent of astronomy data is available. Programs are available for free. Uh, you can read the latest research for free. So everything is available, and so uh, people can can do research at more or uh, more or in more or less uh, depth, depending on their interests, depending on the amount of time they have available, depending on the guidance. So right now I'm guiding uh, two high school students and a few university students where uh, they're, they're looking for, uh, uh, looking, just looking at data. The constraining factor here is my own time. And so uh, uh, there, there, there's uh, just there, there, there's there's other projects uh, going on. Anand Hota, for instance, H O T A, is at uh, this um, uh, Mumbai University. Uh, they, he, he's doing uh, some citizen science project. So yes, there are citizen science projects in astronomy. It's a matter of looking for it and a matter of writing to people. Even even if uh, they're not formal citizen science projects, people do have projects available, and so it's just a question of writing to people and and seeing if uh, if you can do something. Uh, and and there are the the more uh, uh, organized activities like PlanetHunters.org. The advantage of those is that you go in right away and you do something. The disadvantage is that it's very organized. So you do you you work in that little box. You don't go out of the box. It all depends on on what what your time available, what your interest is. Well, many many opportunities. So uh, related to that, Kunal is asking, you know, where can he uh, go and uh, approach an interdisciplinary group to do ML work for uh, in astronomy? like a beginner to get into? Where can you go and get a, which group can you approach or what can you do? Yeah, we have uh, one group uh, with uh, Professor Saha at uh, BITS Goa. So we're working on, on this uh, inter interdisciplinary group. Uh, I, I think in BITS Goa in general, they're doing a fair bit of this interdisciplinary work, but otherwise it's just a matter of looking. I, I, the, the, it's still in its infancy. I had hoped that we could we could seed a bigger group, but that just hasn't happened. I see. Um, and a question from uh, Moinak. Um, I recently heard that Chinese astronomers are planning to launch three artificial satellites, their own moons, so as to solve the electricity problems. How is that possible? And as far as I know, there should be many problems with respect to that. No, I'm sorry, I haven't uh, seen anything about it. And I don't believe that you can solve an electricity problem by going out into space. I know that there've been people talking about reflecting solar power down to uh, solar installations, but I don't believe any of those will be cost effective. Okay. So no, I, I don't know. Okay. The Chinese do have a very active space program and they mm -hmm. are doing many nice things. 20 years ago, I would have said that ISRO is uh, miles ahead of them. Now the Chinese, they're, they're so far ahead of us. It's, uh, it, it, it's truly impressive what they've done. I see. So related to that, could you speak a little bit more about the Indian, uh, you know, either academic situation in astrophysics and space or, and the even the industry situation and even ISRO, like what is the situation in India? Um, how are the entities collaborating? Is the uh, private space industry going off by itself? Is ISRO participating and, you know, kind of collaborating with, uh, you know, uh, private industry and are they collaborating with, uh, you know, astronomers, I mean, uh, astro astrophysicists and astronomers and 
you know, space scientists. Uh, could you comment about the Indian scenario in space tech and astronomy? It's not a very easy question to answer. And now uh, uh, ISRO's mandate when they started was uh, space for society. So they they were interested in things like remote sensing, in uh, education, taking uh, uh, this tele-education, telemedicine, in uh, uh, communications. So that's always been ISRO's mandate. And I think they've done a good job in that. Their remote sensing satellites, communication satellites, and so on. ISRO has done an excellent job in what their core mandate is. Their mandate has never been to do science. And, and uh, I, I mean, that's, I, I'm not saying positive or negative. I'm just saying that when Sarabhai started ISRO, India was, and, and in many ways still is, a poor country. And so uh, you always have a, a, a tough time justifying expenditure in astronomy when you have problems, uh, you have tuberculosis, uh, malaria, you have so many practical problems. Why are you spending money on astronomy? Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a different issue, but, but this has always been the focus. So now ISRO has done few space missions. Astrosat, many people know, Aryabhata was the first one. And then after that, uh, there have been a few here and there. Astrosat was the last major one. Now uh, Aditya is coming up next, uh, probably it'll, it'll launch next year. And so uh, there is some space science, but, but it's not as much as could have. And it's been a very uh, uh, programmatic way of doing things. Whereas what I would have done if I truly wanted to encourage space astronomy, is that I would have made some limited amount of money available and just told people, you go ahead and do what you want. And uh, when you come, when you come, make, it will make sense for you to come to us, you come to us. A relatively small amount of money to a relatively large number of groups. Instead, they give a large amount of money to, to one group. So that, uh, that, that's that part of it. The private scene, Indian science has never been driven by private funding. And I think this is very unfortunate. Uh, the, the, uh, if you look at the amount the government gives to science, India and the US are not so far apart. It's something like uh, India, uh, the US is probably something close to 1% of the GDP on science. India is 0.7%. When I started, it was 1%. Now it's 0.7%. But uh, private, inve private investment into research into universities is much greater in, in the US. So they overall, they spend something like three to 4% of their GDP on science. So private science, private space has not really gone up. There, for, the, for a while, I had hope that universities would pick up the slack because a lot of these private universities, you know they have unlimited amounts of money and they all thought it was a good idea to go into space. But unfortunately, they didn't actually want to do anything. They just wanted to send up a brick into space and say, hey, look, we've launched a satellite.